Welcome back, guys, to the Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve. For last episode, after checking out more of William Shamsby's room before getting kicked out by Inspector Gregson, we witnessed the dead come back to life in front of us before collapsing once again. We then reconvened on Briar Road before heading back inside to talk to Mr. Garadev about what he knew, and then we traveled to the prison to speak to Sozeki Natsume, with Gregson arriving to give the news that the still-alive victim had pointed the finger at the imprisoned bundle of nerves for the attack. We now head to trial to defend our compatriot once again. The old Bailey. This place always makes me feel strange. I seem to get chills down my spine and break out in a nervous sweat all at the same time. Well, I didn't think I'd be back here so soon. That's my line. Good morning. Ah, good morning, Mr. Natsume. It was only two days ago that I was declared not guilty here. Yes, we somehow managed to prove we didn't stab Miss Green in the back. But now this! Another morning, another murder, and here I am again in this hellhole. Can't keep coming to court! I'm beginning to think he's right. It really does seem as though he's cursed. Mr. Nanahodo, I'm afraid I have bad news. Oh! Mr. Natsume, good morning. Yes, morning. So, here we are again. Yes, again. Judicial Assistant Miss Mikotoba Esquire, what's the bad news? Oh dear, you heard, did you? If you come in shouting at the top of your voice, people can't help hearing what you say! <laughs> oh, I am sorry. You've done nothing wrong, Miss Isato. Now, what is it? Well, it seems that the prosecution in today's trial will be led by Lord Barok Van Zeeks. Van... Van Zeeks! Ah! Oh no, oh no, 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 no! The so-called Reaper of the Bailey, the most legendary prosecutor in the land. In the trial two days ago, he pursued Soseki-san and I relentlessly. Of course, by the skin of our teeth, we managed to pull through. But still... Perhaps Mr. Natsume's acquittal in the last trial wasn't the end of the matter. After all... Yes, I know what you're thinking. The legend of the Reaper that says... Nothing can save a person in the dock when Lord Van Zeeks is the prosecutor. Oh no! But even if that person is found not guilty, the accused will meet a mysterious end one way or another. And we've experienced it firsthand. A man we successfully defended met the most terrifying end after his acquittal, right here in the Old Bailey. Ah! Do I have to put up with those ice-cold eyes boring into my soul again? Cursed by evil spirits and now by the Reaper! Pair of petrifying perils, potentially! Well, if it's potentially... At least you appear to have hope, Mr. Natsume. Locum student, Mr. Nanahodo Esquire! Ah, yes? I'm... I'm innocent! You have to believe me! You more than anyone now! Don't worry. I'll be your steadfast ally every step of the way in this battle. I promise. And this promises to be a hard battle, I fear. Well. The trial is scheduled to begin shortly. We should move into the courtroom. Let's go. Oh yes, I forgot to say. I'm afraid he won't be able to make it. Mr. Sholmes, I mean. That's probably for the best. Oh. If he were here, I might be tempted to rely on his help. And that could be seen as a weakness. If Lord Van Zeeks were to notice, he'd prey on it mercilessly. At least, that's my gut feeling. Mr. Nalahodo. You're right. Yes, you're so right. Oh, well said, local student Mr. Nalahodo Esquire. Well said. I swear on the sword of my side and on the spirit of Kazuma that it harbors. I'll show him what a Japanese lawyer can do. I'll set you free. With honor. Oh, yes. So here we go again on the 22nd of February at 9.40 a.m. He's here for a second time. <laughs> I feel sorry for him. Oh, new jury? 
I know, Jerry. In the name of Her Majesty the Queen, I hereby declare this court to be in session. I now call upon the councils for the prosecution and defense to declare their willingness to proceed. The prosecution is ready. The defense is ready, my lord. Readiness for the trial, my learned Nipponese friend, is not what the defense needs. What you need is readiness for your inevitable defeat. It's not just in my imagination, it's really there. Lord Van Zeeks has such an animosity towards this Japanese for some reason. It was some time ago now that he first became known as the Reaper of the Bailey, I believe. These past few years, he hasn't appeared in court at all. Yet now he's back in the courtroom. Though for some reason, only when I'm defending. This Reaper, with his curious disdain for his Japanese, is a prosecutor shrouded in mystery. Still, this isn't the time to be pondering that. I have to concentrate on Sozeki-san's trial. And furthermore, I now call upon the six ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You have been chosen at random to represent the will of the people in this trial. Are you ready to fulfill your duty? Absolutely. I had a feeling this larrikin was an instant before. I must say that I feel especially ruthless on days when my hat refuses to sit right. Oh, well, I rather like how you're wearing your hat. I think the ruthless look is very fetching, actually. I need to be somewhere at 10 o'clock. I have a very important meeting. Let's make this quick. I could agree more. I need to take home five bobs tonight or the missus will go through the roof. Oh, may the Lord show us all the light here and lead his flock to a righteous verdict. The British jury system is so very different to our own, isn't it? It's quite extraordinary to think that the power of judgment is in the hands of six members of the public. And that the judge can only pass sentence when all jurors are in agreement about the defendant's guilt. Six citizens of London, chosen at random. Or at least, that's the idea. The prosecution would draw attention to the fact that the accused was on trial here but two days ago. Accordingly, where possible, the same jurors have been asked to return for duty today. Very well. Let us commence the trial. Lord Van Zeek, your opening statement, please. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is not the intent of the prosecution to cast doubt over your past decision. However, the innocent verdict afforded this eccentric Nipponese before has had dire consequences. Did the accused repent for his wrongdoing in that affair? Far from it. Instead, he used his freedom to perpetrate a most blood-curdling crime. Namely, that of the attempted murder of his neighboring lodger, an innocent Englishman. To explain the circumstances of the crime, the prosecution calls its first witnesses to the stand. The detective responsible for investigating the scene, and the accused himself. Witnesses, your names and occupations, please. Yes, sir! Tobias Gregson, Detective Inspector of Scotland Yard's Homicide Division. Ah, Sozeki Natsumi from the Empire of Japan. My government ordered me to come here as a student to study your language and culture. And Mr. Natsume. Yes, my lord, sir. I'm quite sure I'm not mistaken. As you swore an oath, never to set foot in my courtroom again. I remember it as if it were yesterday. A day before, in fact, my lord. Close enough. Ah, uh, believe me, this is the last place I want to be. Inspector, let's hear from you first. Explain the case for the court. Why, you are, sir? The incident occurred at the Garadab household where the defendant has lodgings. In the ground floor room of the victim, Mr. William Shamspear. The defendant has already admitted to visiting the victim on the night in question. Mr. Shamspear collapsed in his room as a result of poisoning by strychnine. Strychnine, that's the one. <laughs> It was found the following morning when the landlord, suspecting something was wrong, broke down the door. And this means, I presume, that the door to the victim's room was locked at the time of the incident? 
Uh, correct, my lord. It was locked from the inside, making entry to or exit from the room impossible. Although the victim, Mr. Shamsbeer, lives to tell the tale, he very nearly didn't. The man was halfway to heaven when we first found him. Hmm. I was the first officer on the scene, my lord. And I have a photographic print here that I took at the time to show how it looked. Yes, a chilling scene indeed. The man looks very much deceased. That's right. Everyone present believed that's exactly what he was. Very well. I, I shall accept this photographic print as evidence of the court. Made me stop for a second because it's this. A fair few things different in that picture already. The crime scene photograph has been entered into the court record. Now then, Mr. Natsume. Uh, y y yes, yes, yes. As the defendant, do you have anything to say at this juncture? They're, they're haunted. Haunted by evil spirits. Uh, good gracious, what haunted? My lodgings! There's been a whole series of strange happenings in my lodgings! The tenant before me died in mysterious circumstances. A woman was stabbed by one on, no one on the street outside. My neighbor was poisoned. And me! What about me? I've nearly been killed countless times. I killed Mr. Natsume. How? Even on that fateful night it happened, when I returned from Mr. Shamsby's room. I lit my gas stove and climbed into bed, but before long, the stove went out. And somebody tried to kill me! You must always extinguish all fires before retiring for the night, Miss Anatomy. But it's so cold! My, my runny nose would freeze! The point is, I, I didn't poison my neighbor! Oh, why am I being accused of this? Why is my existence so cursed? Thank you, witnesses. I believe I have a reasonably clear picture of events. If I could raise one more point, my lord. One more conclusive point. Conclusive? Go on. Fortunately, the victim, Mr. Shamsbeer, has regained consciousness after his ordeal, and he has named the true culprit. The poison consumed by the victim was administered in a cup of tea that he drank on the night in question. Tea, my lord, that was brought to the victim's room by the accused. And the accused? Good grief! Order! Order! Yes, that's the crux of this whole case. If Suzeki-san is innocent, then why? Why has the victim accused him? Well, Miss Anatome, what have you to say to this accusation? That evening, yes, I did take some freshly brewed tea with me when I visited Mr. Shamsby's room as a gift. The public water pump outside always freezes at night, so I bought bottled water especially to make it. And this is the result? Never will I touch tea again. Never! The public pump was frozen, you say? That's not information we've heard before. That will do. Thank you. Now, according to our law, the defense must have the opportunity to cross-examine witnesses at least once. And therefore, I call upon these witnesses now for a formal testimony. I presume the prosecution has no objection. None whatsoever, my lord. Good. Then you will give your account of events on the night in question to the court now. Y y y y y y y yes, my lord. The catastrophic night. It was around 9 o'clock that evening when I visited my neighbor and I took some tea with me as a gift. We had a heated literary debate over a nice hot drink, after which I went back to my room at around 11. Ah, my tea was completely harmless. He couldn't have locked the door behind me otherwise, could he? Trignine takes some time to have an effect on the body. People don't kill over immediately after taking it. The victim would have been perfectly able to lock the door after his guest left. The argument still stands. I think that's how you pronounce that poison. Oh, uh, yes, I see. It all seems relatively straightforward. Excuse me, but that testimony does raise one rather crucial point, I think. Mr. Natsume claims his tea to have been harmless. Presumably, though, the teacups have been examined for traces of the poison, haven't they? Why didn't I think of that? Well, as it happens, nah. We haven't been able to. 
Did I hear you correctly, Inspector? Scotland Yard has failed to examine the suspect's substance? How could you have overlooked something so important? Isn't that the first thing you should have done? My learned Nipponese friend is falsely incensed. The inspector said Scotland Yard was unable to examine the tea, not that it was overlooked. Unable? Why? It's simple enough. There was none left. Not a drop. Someone must have been very thirsty indeed. With current scientific techniques, it's not possible to test for poison under such circumstances. We only need a drop, but that one drop does actually have to exist, funny enough. Ugh. The lack of examination notwithstanding, it appears nothing other than the tea passed the victim's lips on the night in question. I see. Thank you. The matter is clear. Cast your eyes over the jury, my learned friend. What? You can see it in their faces, I'm sure. The recognition of the accused's guilt. Your client's fate is all but sealed. In mere moments from now, you will lose, and your compatriot will be damned for all eternity. He's right. I can feel all six of the jurors looking daggers at me. But I can't let them beat me down. I won't. A counsel for the defense, proceed with your cross-examination. Yes, my lord. The Catastrophic Night. It was around nine o'clock that evening when I visited my neighbor and I took some tea with me as a gift. Hold it! Were you and your neighbor good friends then? Ah, no! We weren't friends, not at all, not at all! Never, ever! A simple no would have sufficed? Then, uh, why did you decide to pay him a visit? Mr. Shamsbeer fancied himself as having great literary knowledge. As a fellow scholar of English literature, we find much to talk about together. And come now, no Nipponese could understand the finer points of English literature. And on the night in question, that was the topic of conversation as well, I presume. It was the day of my last trial when I was acquitted. I just arrived back at my lodgings when I ran into Mr. Shansby outside on the street. That was around six o'clock. We exchanged one or two pleasantries, but it soon turned into a heated discussion. He was on his way out of the time, though. So I promised to visit his room that evening at nine to continue our debate. But did I have ill intentions? No, not one, not two, not any. Not at all. Never, ever. A simple no would have sufficed, I feel. And tell the court what did happen when you visited the victim's room. We had a heated literary debate over a nice hot drink, after which I went back to my room at around 11. Hold it! A literary debate about Shakespeare's works, I think you said, didn't you? Shakespeare! Ah, very worthy topic of conversation, I must say. Ah, oh, yes, my lord. Romeo and Juliet, who was stronger? It was a profoundly pleasurable parley. Romeo and Juliet? Who was stronger? I know I'm going to regret asking this, but how did the debate go? Well, we both agreed that we would reach a conclusion more quickly with a reenactment. So we battled it out. In a Greco-Roman style, naturally. What? Mr. Shamsby had all sorts of costumes in his room for just such a contest. So when you say a reenactment, you mean you were actually in costume? He is Romeo, I is Juliet, and after a vigorous wild tussle, I as Juliet came out on top. A victory I'll cherish forever! I dare not imagine the terrible scene of carnage. The fact remains that it was you who prepared the tea and took it to the victim, correct? I poured the water in my room and made a pot to take with me. I'd heard that he was too poor to have tea himself, you see. It's true, there was no sign of any tea leaves in the man's room. I wanted to do something nice, to be friendly. So why is everyone looking at me with such suspicion? My tea was harmless, of course it was. And do you have any basis for that statement, witness? Ah, oh, my tea was completely harmless. He couldn't have locked the door behind me otherwise, could he? Hold it! 
Yes, there was not a drop of tea left in the victim's room anywhere, was there? That's correct. Anyone would think the fellow had never had a pot of tea before. He must have licked it dry. Which is a pity, because one drop is all we would have needed to analyze it for poison. And you say that you returned home to your room at 11 o'clock, Mr. Natsume. Yes, definitely. By heaven and earth, I swear it. The landlord was able to verify that as it happens. He confirmed that the defendant went back to his room at 11 that night. And how is the landlord able to attest to this? He, um, said it was the lamps, I believe. The lamps, Inspector. When tenants return to their rooms and start using gas, the lamps in other parts of the house flicker. Yes, Mr. Garadev seems to pay a lot of attention to the comings and goings of his tenants. There's only one key to Mr. Shamsby's room. I know that for certain. So he must have locked the door himself from inside his room. The victim has confirmed that to be the case, yes. So I'm right. My tea was harmless. Completely harmless. If you take poison, you die. Everyone knows that. It's not that simple, I'm afraid. Uh, well, what do you mean? Strychnine takes some time to have an effect on the body. People don't kill over immediately after taking it. Hold it! How long does it take the symptoms to appear, then? According to the coroner I was speaking to at the yard, about 30 minutes after the poison was consumed. And the victim suffers violent convulsions, cramping and stiffness, and eventually dies from asphyxiation. So there's a 30 minute interval between when the poison is ingested and the onset of symptoms. There seem to be a lot of different types of poison in the world, that's for sure. Oh dear, death by poisoning again. It's always so awful. 30 minutes is a long time. Certainly long enough for the victim to have locked the door behind the accused after he left. You can't deny that. And it further degrades the Sekizan's alibi. I have the medical report from the doctor who examined the victim here, my lord. It spells it out, really. The accused is the only person who could have done it. Very well. The court will add this report to the court record as evidence. The victim's medical report has been entered into the court record. Oh yes, I see it here. Delayed onset of symptoms. Great. The victim would have been perfectly able to lock the door after his guest left. The argument still stands. Well, before I do anything, I'm going to check that out. Because we need details and information here, there, and everywhere. I don't know if there's anything to examine so much on this torn off end of envelope. Whoever opened this envelope didn't bother with a letter opener or scissors, did they? Yes, whoever opened it was clearly someone with an unrefined temperament. And judging from the angle of the rip here, the person in question must have been right-handed. Miss Suzuto, I think perhaps someone's been reading too much of the adventures of Herlock Jones. You can never read too much of it, Mr. Nahodo. Never. So not much identifying stuff there. A puddle, man. Puddle, puddle. Also, the floorboard. I'm interested. So the victim's medical report we just received. Victim is William Shansby, 31 years of age. Cause of coma, ingestion of a small quantity of strychnine. Strychnine. Toxic effects. <laughs> strychnine. Yes, that trips me off quite a lot. Toxic effects present 30 minutes after ingestion. I likelihood of the substance having been mixed with the tea the victim was drinking, but no sample could be obtained for testing. Investigative conclusions. The poisoning incident occurred around 1.30 a.m. on 21st February. Assessed from the victim's pocket watch that appears to have broken when the man collapsed after the delayed onset of symptoms. No container for the poison was found at the scene. I'm assuming something's up with the time. It's the time. Right. We had a heated literary debate over a nice hot drink, after which I went back to my room at around 11. However, this says the poisoning took place supposedly at 1.30. Weirdly, that's kind of conjecture itself, because it's assessed from the victim's pocket watch that appears to have broken when the man collapsed. Kind of sounds really weird. How do you assess it as that? There's a two and a half hour difference there. So we've got our thing to present, quite evidently. Objection. My dear Wilson. Mr. Natsume, you say it was 11 p.m. when you left to return to your room, correct? Yes! 
And Inspector Gregson, can we rely on the information in the medical report unconditionally? Of course we can. There's no problem with that report, sunshine. Actually, I think there's a very big problem because there's a chronological inconsistency between it and the defendant's testimony. A chrono what? What are you on about? According to this report, the victim must have consumed the poison at around 1.30 in the morning. And yet, the defendant, Mr. Natsume, left the victim's room at 11. Ah! Yes, that's right. There's more than two hours of missing time there. No. In other words, if there was poison in the tea that Mr. Natsume brought to the victim's room, how could the victim have fallen ill to it two and a half full hours after the defendant left? Rah! A defendant argument is entirely reasonable. How do you respond, Lord Van Zeeks? Pray forgive the discourtesy if my mind has wandered. I was considering what cuisine would best to complement the contents of my hallowed chalice this luncheon. How could it have happened, you ask? I do hate to shatter illusions, but my Nipponese friend appears to be chasing a phantom, my dear. A phantom? It is so hard to imagine that the victim drank his tea after the accused had left. For example, at the time stated in the medical report, yes, at around half past one. Objection. Oh, tea's horrible! Mr. Natsume brought the tea with him to drink together with his neighbor. And in Japan, there is a well-known saying. Drink tea while it's hot. Objection. And in my country, there is an even more apt saying. There is nothing more refreshing than cold tea. Ugh. The, the point is, if there was such a long gap, there may be other ways to explain how the victim came to be poisoned. Other possibilities. What sort of possibilities, Council? Well, for example, the man could have had another visitor. Another visitor? That's a very bold assertion, my learned friend. From someone who has nothing to substantiate it. Or, or the victim could have taken the poison of his own volition. You suggest this may have been a suicide, Council? Objection! Mr. Shamspear has categorically denied suicide. The idea can and must be discounted. Objection! But... but he could be lying! Is something wrong, Lord Van Zeeks? I was listening to the sound of the carriage pulling up outside the courtroom. Pray forgive the discourtesy. Carriage? What carriage? It would seem... that the key player in this case has just arrived. Out, out, brief candle. Life's but a walking shadow. A poor player that struts and frets his hour upon the stage, and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Who, sir, are you? William Shamspear, my lord. Alas, twas I, undone by these bitter events. I am the victim. What? What's he doing here? The prosecution seeks to call this gentleman to the stand. With his testimony, my learned friend's futile resistance will be utterly crushed. You're calling him as a witness. Very well, Counsel. I grant your request with interest. 
I'm curious to discover what the court will hear from the victim himself. Happy am I, Shamspear, to regale thee with my tale of woe, my lord. But, but, I still have my own tale to tell, my own tale of worse woe. I can regale the court with the tale of my perfect innocence, in perfect English. That will do, Miss Anatomy. Let the court now hear from the victim. All right, so that's Mr. Shamspear. But who's that other man besides him? That is a good question. But before we continue on with testimony and more, we have William Shamspear here, and we have the other guy that we saw him having a go with. Well, we saw him outside the property, not just barely an episode back, but also a whole game back. So we finally get to the bottom of who these characters are. Maybe a bit more next time on The Great Ace Attorney 2 Resolve with a new testimony. I'll see you guys then for more. Bye-bye.